Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise tonight in response to the request by the member for Toronto Centre to debate the situation in Syria in accordance with Standing Order 52-9. Our government, and indeed most Canadians, have been following the situation in Syria very closely for the last two years, and particularly in the last few months. All Canadians are extremely concerned about the loss of life, human rights abuses, destruction of property, and the destabilizing impact this civil war has had on the region. I think all members of this House share the desire for this conflict to come to an end and to see the Assad regime topple. Our government has expressed this sentiment consistently for the last 18 months to 24 months, Mr. Speaker. In recent weeks, an already terrible situation appears to be spiraling towards the depths of barbarism. The potential use of chemical weapons is something the world must examine closely and carefully. This need for careful examination stems from the fact that the use of these weapons will likely lead to a serious response by Canada and our international allies. By now, we have likely all seen the disturbing images coming out of Syria. Patients in hospitals appearing to be suffering the effects of the use of a chemical toxin. These weapons have the potential for mass destruction and death, and certainly causing greater suffering for the people of Syria, and on top of that, wider panic and instability in the region, which will lead to a greater rise in refugees to border states and raise a risk level in an already unstable part of this world. Syria is also not a signatory to the Chemical Weapons Convention, Canada is a signatory to this convention, Mr. Speaker, and we have a long track record of working with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Indeed, the United Nations and our allies in NATO have been watching the potential risk with respect to chemical weapons in Syria very closely. The member of Toronto Centre has suggested in this debate tonight that there's some tension in the position of the government. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I think the position of the government has been unequivocal. Assad must go and the death and suffering needs to end. The issue for our country and for this debate tonight is to determine what role Canada should play in the pursuit of these outcomes. In listening to the debate tonight, it's clear that the members of this House, including those from the Liberal Party, do not advocate direct military action. Certainly, the Canadian forces are one of the most highly trained and professional militaries in the world. But a civilian protection mission would require boots in the ground, and we're not prepared to do that, Mr. Speaker. Syrian air defense is also considerably more developed than that in Libya. It's also a more dense airspace, making any international multilateral military action extremely complicated and risky. It also seems clear that most members of this House do not ag advocate providing arms or military assistance to the rebels. I read a quote from the NDP critic stating that this was not Canada's approach. Finally, it also appears that most members acknowledge that this civil war is not clearly demarcated by a monolithic rebel force on one side and the Assad regime on the other. The rebels may very well be a coalition of various groups within Syria opposed to the regime for different reasons. Most importantly, the rebels do not appear to share aspirations for a post-Assad Syria. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, with all these seeming a points of agreement in mind, I would expect that most members of this House should agree with the government's approach to the Syrian crisis. The Prime Minister and this government has advocated a strong multilateral approach with the United Nations and our allies to apply strong diplomatic pressure upon the regime and to investigate seriously the possible use of chemical weapons. On March 21st, the Secretary General of the United Nations launched an investigation into the alleged use of chemical weapons in Syria. Canada strongly supports this investigation, Mr. Speaker. Any and all credible allegations, including potential incidents in homes late last year and more recently in Adra, will be pursued. The UN has staged inspectors in Cyprus ready to conduct this investigation. These inspectors have been selected, trained, and are ready to deploy on one day's notice. There just needs to be a cessation of hostilities or some form of security 
for this investigation to, con to occur. Canada, Mr. Speaker, was one of the first countries to pledge direct financial support for the United Nations investigation of the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Canada has also provided some direct unilateral assistance to neighboring countries dealing with the threat posed by chemical weapons. Detection equipment and protective gear have been provided to the Jordanian Armed Forces to guard against chemical weapons or a biological incident arising from Syria. Canada has also provided support to strengthen civilian capabilities to respond to chemical or other attacks affecting the people of Jordan. We've also pledged support for the establishment of a regional biological risk management training center at a Jordanian university in cooperation with our allies, the UK and the US. At the time of this debate in our House of Commons this evening, Mr. Speaker, the UN-led investigation into chemical weapons use and the threat they pose is at an impasse. This is not acceptable. Canada supports the UN Secretary General's repeated efforts to resolve the current impasse so that all credible allegations are investigated as soon as possible. Like our UN and NATO allies, Canada continues to demand that Syrian authorities grant full and unfettered access to the United Nations investigation team immediately. In recent weeks, Mr. Speaker, there have been news reports and even statements by UN officials that suggest there is evidence of use of chemical weapons like sarin gas by both the Assad regime and a section of rebel forces. While the UN Commission of Inquiry for Syria quickly distanced itself from these statements related to weapon use by the rebels, the Commission did state, and I quote, that it has not reached conclusive findings as to the use of chemical weapons in Syria by any parties to the conflict, unquote. Mr. Speaker, the fog of war, the increased use of media as a tactical advantage, and influence operation by parties in a modern conflict show the need for a UN-led investigation to provide clear answers. Mr. Speaker, Canada is pursuing a clear but careful approach to Syria. We are working unilaterally with allies and with countries like Jordan in the region to address the threats caused by the conflict. This government is also committed to our multilateral course of action with respect to Syria as well, working with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and the United Nations. Canada has taken a principled and consistent stand on Syria, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work with our international partners to contain the threat caused by the situation in Syria, and we will continue to apply global pressure on the Assad regime, Mr. Speaker. These are very difficult times. This was a very good time for this House to revisit this issue and Canada's response. And Mr. Speaker, I think the, the careful and thoughtful deliberation by my colleagues today indicates that Canada cannot rush in to an action engaging our military forces. We must keep this as a clear diplomatic uh, effort on our part. And we must clearly work with our allies, the United Nations and, and NGOs working under the auspices of the United Nations, our allies in NATO, to not only assess the military threats on the region, but assess the, the, the real use of chemical weapons on the ground in Syria, Mr. Speaker. Um, I appreciate the thoughtful co uh, comments from all sides of this debate, but I do think this government has pursued a very principled and rational approach. Uh, we're also dealing with uh, the humanitarian crisis surrounding Syria, Mr. Speaker, and we've heard tonight on all sides some acknowledgement that Canada has reacted to refugees, particularly with regard to family reunification. I think even members on this side of the House have acknowledged we can do that perhaps faster and better, Mr. Speaker, but it is clear from comments on the other side that those efforts are underway and that there's real and meaningful efforts by the Minister to uh, expedite family reunifications while also providing the, the appropriate oversight in relation to security, pot potential security risks that might be associated with widespread uh, departures during time of war. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Question and comment. L'honorable député de la Pointe de Lille. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Et euh, mon collègue a bien mentionné justement le fait que, bon, comment le, la, la, la situation va se régler de façon diplomatique, de façon politique, 
et avec l'ONU. Alors, j'aimerais que mon collègue puisse euh, commenter un petit peu la contradiction dans son discours. D'un côté, son gouvernement euh, refuse euh, d'essayer d'obtenir un nouveau siège au Conseil de sécurité, qui est pas mal l'organe le plus important au niveau international pour la, la, la résolution de conflits. Euh, refuse de prendre ses responsabilités au niveau international en se retirant de plusieurs traités, en prenant des positions qui sont euh, fortement euh, dénoncées par la, la communauté internationale. Alors, comment on peut prétendre que le gouvernement va utiliser euh, sa notoriété diplomatique alors que, dans les faits, c'est tout le contraire? Merci, M. le Président. The Honorable Member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague on the opposite side for her passion and evidently her, her knowledge of, uh, of the subject. I would refer to my remarks where I highlighted not only Canada's unilateral efforts, which is direct country to country, uh, our, our efforts multilaterally through the United Nations and through uh, work with our allies in NATO and our allies around the world. Importantly, she referenced the Security Council, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Security Council, which can authorize UN sanction force in certain circumstances, has clearly already articulated that that won't happen. There are two permanent members of, of that Security Council that will um, not allow the Council per, to pursue a UN-sanctioned military, uh, military effort. So, Mr. Speaker, this is an area where the UN is one important part of Canada's diplomatic statecraft uh, in this effort, alongside unilateral relations, alongside direct visits by the minister to the region. There's a whole uh, plethora of things that, that Canada is doing to apply pressure. UN is one important part of that. I would suggest to the honourable member that even a seat at the Security Council in these days would not change what's coming from that, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Question and comment the honourable member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to take this occasion, belated as it is, to congratulate the member on his election in November. We've not had an opportunity to put a question to the member from Durham before. And when he speaks of presentations this evening that were thoughtful and calming, I must say his was one, thoughtful and, uh, and took into account what we all feel, that we must not be imagining for one moment that Canada wants to engage militarily in Syria. It's nice to reaffirm that there's consensus in this place on that. And I also appreciate his recognition of the toolkit of statescraft and diplomacy of the United Nations and our other relationships. I'd ask him very specifically if it wouldn't make sense for us in this House to agree by consensus that there's more we can do in humanitarian effort, particularly in those uh, very significant humanitarian crises that exist in the refugee camps, particularly in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, by providing more assistance directly through humanitarian relief in the camps by offering that assistance to those governments that are hosting all those refugees. Honourable Member for Durham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd, I'd like to thank the member, the, the leader of the Green Party, for her nice remarks welcoming me. Certainly, we share some time at Dalhousie Law School together, al although not at the same time. Um, her questions are good ones. In fact, we are working, Mr. Speaker, with, with other states in the region to, to address the refugee crisis uh, caused by the Syrian civil war in the last two years of it. Um, I think members on this side have expressed that we need to, need to do more and particularly watch how that evolves. There's also security ramifications caused by a refugee and an exodus uh, under these circumstances. But importantly, I've also heard some discussion in, that, in the chamber tonight about NGOs and, and actions by, by, by non-state actors on the ground in Syria. And I think we have to express some words of caution. It's, we're not even at the halfway point in 2013. And I'd remind this House that Syria is in a state of war with, um, as I said in my remarks, very hard to identify uh, teams within that war. There's certainly a united front against a regime and then a regime. There's been five journalists killed. We're, we're, we're just a week or da days past Press Freedom Day. There's been five journalists killed this year in Syria. Um, just last month, there was two archbishops abduct abducted. So it's a country that we have to proceed cautiously, even with non-state actors on the ground, Mr. Speaker. 